It's over. England are out of the World Cup. We were ready 2006. We should have done it at that time. After extra time, following a nil-nil draw against Portugal. I thought we were mentally stronger for that, but at the end we weren't. Once again, they've lost on penalties. Is that your biggest regret in football? Losing that game was... Football management is a tough job in a harsh and unforgiving industry. Success is all that matters, and failure is shown no mercy. In nearly 30 years of covering the sport that I love, I've been fortunate enough to watch the great and the good at work, up close and sometimes very personal. But now I want to dig deeper to find out what it takes to be a celebrated and successful manager. What they were born with, who inspired them, and what they've learnt on their way to the very top of the game. The changes they've seen in football, and the changes they've helped create. These are my football godfathers. Sven Juren Eriksson is one of the most recognised managers in the world of football. He rose from relative obscurity here in his native Sweden from the third division, took on to win trophies all across Europe, in Portugal, Italy, and then he took the big one, the England manager's job. He's had a fantastic and colourful career, to say the very least. I'm looking forward to renewing old acquaintances and seeing whether or not this time we really can get to know the real Sven Goran Eriksson. The average England football fan can name three of your former girlfriends. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not very proud of that. Hello! Hello, Tiff. How, How are, are you? you? Good to see you. Yeah, I expected to qualify for the World Cup. I'm surprised to get such a warm welcome for a member of the English media. <laughs> don't kill this young boy. You can kill me because you don't need me anymore. Come in, please. I want to start, first of all, right here, where we are, in Sweden, very, very close to where you were brought up. How much of your character, your personality, was formed here? And how would you describe that character? Uh, I would guess a lot, because I'm born here, I grew up here, and I left this place when I was uh, 18, 19. So a lot of me is like people are here, I would guess. Which is what? Rather calm. Especially if you speak about my parents, my brother, and so on, my family. Uh, we don't shout very much. Uh, calm, thinking about if we have a problem, what to do, how to resolve it. Things like that. Oh, it's got a fantastic character. This is in your soul, isn't it? This is you. Yeah, I'm born down there, and I've grown up up there. Can you tell me your very earliest football memory? <laughs> I think my grandfather took me, and my grandfather lived on the other side of the lake there. He took me to a football match when Sund, which is a couple of kilometers here, played in second division which was great for this place of Sweden. And we were looking at a game against one of the most famous teams in, in, uh, in Sweden. And at that time, one of the big uh, fans of Sunna, he was sitting next to me and my grandfather. And he, he talked about the players in Sunna. Uh, I thought he, he talked bullshit, so I told him. <laughs> And I remember my grandfather was very, very proud of me. Said to his wife, Sven, he talked to the biggest fan of Sunna and told him what to do and not to do. <laughs> As a player, I always dreamt about to be a first division football player in, in Sweden and of course to be a national team player. But I was not good enough for that, and I tried very, very, very hard. I trained more than anybody else, uh, by myself and together with other people. Not only the normal practice sessions, but I was not good enough for it. Did you know that yourself straight away? 
Yeah, when you starting to be 25, 26, you realize that mm, I'm not going anywhere. I was uh, so and so right back in second division, and that was the maximum I achieved in football as a player. When was this made? 15 years ago, maybe. But I don't know if it looks like me or not. Stand next to it and see if there's a likeness. Uh, That was maybe one of the biggest changes in my life. So I think he wanted to help me and what he saw in me to be a coach, I don't know. But we've been together and we know each other very well. So I always thank Tor Grip for the proposal he came with and one of the, my best decisions in life to stop playing and start to be a coach. And yet within five years, you go from coaching a third division team to winning the treble in Sweden as a manager and Sweden's first ever <laughs> European trophy. Yes, that's true. It happened very quickly, yes. And uh, when Tord said, I'm leaving now, after one year, year we worked together, I said, what shall I do then? Well, you take over the team. And I told him, you know, Tord, I'm too young for that. I don't have the experience and things like that. It's already done, he said. I have fixed that. The job is yours. I've been to England. Uh, I went to Liverpool many times to see them. I went to see Bobby Robson in Ipswich, which was great. It's funny you should say that, but I have here a programme from wow. Ipswich Town versus Aston Villa. Yes, that's the game I saw. The very night. Thank you very much. What memories does that bring back and what stories? Big memories because at that time, this was 78, yeah. He didn't know me. I had sent him a letter asking, can I come and look at training? Mm -hmm. And I got an answer, yes, you can come. And I met him for the first time and... At the, at, at the training? <clears throat> at the training, the day before this match. And did he show you training, was generous with his I time? saw the training and then I said, do you have two minutes for me? And we were sitting there for three hours <laughs> talking. <laughs> and I was up in the sky. <clears throat> and then at the end he asked me, do you have tickets for tomorrow's game? No, I said, but I will buy that, don't, don't worry, I take care of that. No, where do you want to sit? In the stand, he said, or on the bench with me? I said, I can't sit on the bench. Of course you can. I was sitting next to him. <laughs> Incredible. He was a wonderful but man. That was Bobby Robson, yes. Although they were, and they are, obviously one of Sweden's most famous clubs, at the time they were not doing well, were they? No, they had struggled a little bit and they bought a lot of famous football players, some of them old, coming back from professional football in Holland and so on. Uh, so they wanted to do better. I was very nervous. Probably I've never been that nervous in my life because I was no one. And if you talked about football Sweden, they didn't know who I was. They never heard the name. Third division, it's one thing to play in the first division. Top level is quite another thing. And they had players playing in the national team, been playing in, around Europe as professionals. The style they played, they called it champagne football. It was uh, elegant, it should be dribbling, it should be things like that. And of course, when I started there, I did quite the opposite. We have done same practice, more or less, every day. The players, they were fed up with it, I, I suppose. But also they knew exactly what to do every time, every second of the game. Attacking, defending. Because we never changed our way of playing. It was 4-4-2. Four, four, and if it was one minute, two minutes to go, and we had one nil or two nil, I took out a striker and I put in another striker. I never put out a striker and put in a midfielder or a defender, never. 4-4-2, four, four, that's it. Totally the op opposite. And some of the fans became very angry. 
on me. How did you win them over? By winning football games. <laughs> when the results came, life is easy. Now, like all Swedes, you've got a Volvo in your garage, but you've got a bit more than that, haven't you? Yeah, some memories. Is this the UEFA Cup winning team? Yes, 82. We have to remember, your players at the time, they weren't all full-time, were they? They were, were they all full-time professionals? No, 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 no. <clears throat> In Sweden, no. Uh, even when we won 1982, the UEFA Cup. What sort of jobs were your players doing? Well, one of them was a plumber. He came the day before and said, match day, can I have a half day off? I said, yes, for sure, you can. So he worked from 7 to 12 in the morning as a plumber. <laughs> and then played in a European final. And he scored. <laughs> <laughs> but if you tell that today, people can't believe it. But that was the case. Swedish football was not professional in the beginning of 80s. 80s. So even though you won the home leg 1-0, was there still very much an air of, oh, well, they've had their day in the sun, this will all finish yeah. in Germany? Very much so. And uh, they were sure to win. And they should have won, maybe, but not as they played, but all people said, OK, Gothenburg has done it very well so far, but now it's finished. And it wasn't. You know, at that time, the teams from Southern Europe, or rest of Europe, they didn't really understood what we were doing. And when you look at it from outside, it looked very easy, and we looked clumsy, maybe. So every team we met, they, they thought, easy. But when you are there and you don't have time on the ball, because we pressed all the time, uh, then you realize, wow, this is not easy. When Benfica came, well, goodbye, and that's it. <laughs> Roma and Lazio, they hate each other. Let's sell Signori. What do you mean by that? Did you know that you were going to start a war? Yes. I'm in Sweden, in the hometown of Sven Joran Eriksson, a football godfather who's won multiple titles during a managerial career that has spanned over four decades. Is this the UEFA Cup winning team? Yes. By 1981, Sven was one of the hottest properties in European football, having led Swedish part-timers Gothenburg to victory in the UEFA Cup. With a host of clubs pursuing him, he could take his pick. He chose Lisbon as his destination to manage Portuguese giants Benfica. Did you know that was the perfect moment to leave Sweden? Yeah, I had uh, renewed my contract with Gothenburg at that time and I put in a clausule and that was between quarter-final and semi-final in the UEFA Cup. I put in, if a big uh, European club comes, I can leave. And that happened. And uh, when Benfica, huge club, came, well, what to do? Saying goodbye and that's it. <laughs> So how did you feel when you went to Benfica and they walked you around and they showed you their trophy room, <laughs> which included two European Cups? When I came from Gothenburg, I had some something in my luggage. Yes. And Benfica had uh, not been winning uh, titles for uh, some time. So I think it was easier at that time. I knew that I can do something. Before I went to Gothenburg, I didn't know that. I had no idea. I couldn't dream about that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah. Everybody wants to win a trophy. Benfica is a little bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> That was the golden period of Italian football, wasn't it, when you were there? Yes. That's when all the world's great players were there. Yes, it was. I think 80s, uh, 90s, the best football they played in Italy. The best players, 
the interest of football was incredible. Well, it's always the interest, it's always big in Italy. But during that time, Italian football was the most watched, I would guess. I came to Roma and um, it was difficult because it was an old team with old players who were on the way down. So I struggled in the beginning. My first year in Roma was difficult, difficult year. Why? When people coming half an hour late, 45 minutes late, and uh, the third, fourth time, it's traffic. I said, bloody hell, of course it's traffic. You live in Rome. <laughs> so I, sometimes I thought I should have gone to Barcelona in, instead, because I had an offer from Barcelona. Uh, I have a long list of clubs that you nearly managed. Yeah, nearly. <clears throat> but anyhow, second year and the years after became much better. Now look here, this is this is before the stress of management got you. <laughs> look at all of that hair. During your spell in Italy, you were in the shadow, the dark shadow of match fixing and gambling. How did you find that and deal with that? <clears throat> with Roma, when we lost against Lecce at home, <clears throat> five of the players were accused of selling the game. Nobody knows. Was it true? Was it not true? But that's uh, really the only time I uh, was could connected you, with it. And I you, was... Could you smell it, though, Sven, on the day? Could you tell there's something not right here? Well, that game, yes, you think, what was that? Why did that happen? Of course, but you have to think in the future. You cannot go and think about that. You have to learn how to deal with a defeat because you will have defeats, and that's very, very difficult to accept and to come over. I never sleep after a game if we win, draw or lose. But when you lose, it's harder. So you have to take that out of your head now, Sven. It's a new game next Sunday. So that's uh, one thing. And I think I learned very quickly that don't think, me, don't think, Sven, that you know everything about football. You have to listen to other coaches, and also listen to your own players. Because they might have very good ideas about what's right, what's wrong, how to do things. But I think I learned that very early in my career. Was it difficult to go to Lazio, having previously been the manager of Roma? A little bit, because of Roma and Lazio, that's two teams from Rome, and the derbies, that's, that's serious things, <laughs> very serious. They, they hate each other. I was convinced that, unfortunately, Signori and <clears throat> also another player, less famous, they were not good for the team, they were not good for the atmosphere. They were negative in everything. They always said Lazio can never ever win anything. Lazio is good until Christmas, then we go down. Lazio is a team with bad luck always. And hearing this every day from the big star, national team player, captain of the team, I decided no, I don't want to hear this anymore. Did you know that you were going to start a war? Yes. Uh, well, you understood it when I went to the owner, the chairman, and said, he was sitting, we had lunch together, and at the end of the lunch I said, I, had some, I have something important to ask you. Yeah, and he said, Sven, what do you want? <clears throat> Let's sell Signori. And he, he looked at me and said, 
what do you mean by that? We can't sell Signori. Yes, we can. And I had to convince him, and <clears throat> he did. And the police were there, and we, we couldn't train, because people came over the walls, and, and they were sitting on my Volvo, banking. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, a Scudetto. Yes, and, um, yeah, I had a, we had, I should say, extremely good football team. Maybe the best club team I ever had. I had, for example, six, seven of these players could be easily the captain of the team. Mm. All experienced, uh, all playing football on extremely high level, and all of them winners and positive people. We can do it, we shall win. It was great to have them. Maybe that was one of my best times as a coach. Well, first of all, you live in Rome. You win, I think we won seven titles in three years with a team who hadn't won anything for 30 years, 25, 30 years. And Rome is beautiful. <laughs> so it was difficult at that time to pay a dinner in a restaurant. So, no, great times. but. Then that finished, and life has to go on. Don't kill this young boy. You can kill me because you don't need me anymore. Yeah, I expected to qualify for the World Cup. We were ready 2006. We should have done it at that time. This is the last game. I'm in conversation with Sven Juran Eriksson, the footballing godfather who has won league championships in three different countries. I think we won seven titles in three years. Great times. By the beginning of the new millennium, Sven's success at club level led him to the role that proved to be the biggest challenge of his career. Boss, welcome to England. 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 Great. Really? Yeah, England is great, of course. Did you actually say, when you were offered the job, that it was the biggest job in the world at the time? Yes, I did. I still say. No one to blame but myself, you know? I did it to the very best of my ability, but I'm just not the man to take it that stage further. Was there any part of you that hesitated because you would be the first foreign manager of England? I had uh, three, three and a half years behind me, extremely successful, and I was very, very happy in Italy with Lazio and uh, with the city, Rome. So one small thought was, shall I give up this to jump on something you don't know if it's going to be successful or not. But the other part of the head said, you cannot say no to that. You have to take it, and that's it. Do you remember when you took the job, meeting the British Prime Minister? Yes. And what he said to you? <laughs> he asked me if we should take a bet. <laughs> this is Tony Blair. Tony Blair, yes, yes. I was confused, because that was the first, welcome to England, shall we take a bet? Uh, yes. <laughs> he said, who is going to keep the job longest, you or me, he said. Because, he said, there are two impossible jobs. He won the bet. <laughs> what did you expect, and did it turn out to be similar to what you expected? What I expected, yeah, I expected to qualify for the World Cup. Yes. <laughs> Many, many times I interviewed you before and after games. And if you, England, after the 5-1 against Germany or after the, the loss to Northern Ireland, to the outside, there wasn't a lot of difference. Yeah, maybe. 
But you know, you are never as good as people think you are after winning 5-1 against Germany. You're never that good. And on the other hand, you are never that bad as people think you are after losing Northern Ireland away 1-0 in a qualification game. So you are somewhere in, in, in the middle there. But um, that's not what you and your colleagues want to hear. No. Of after, uh, surely it's human, after you've just beaten Germany 5-1 <coughs> in their own backyard, that's euphoric, isn't it? A sensational moment, one for celebration. Not we're going to win the World Cup, but real celebration. Yeah. And when you lose, with all due respect, to Northern Ireland and play badly, that's, that's a terrible result. Of course. <laughs> but you were like that. <clears throat> you weren't Sven like, you were Zen like. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe. But I think that's how I am. Uh, of course, I have all the feelings that everybody has. You're happy, you're angry, you're disappointed, whatever it is. And of course, beating Germany 5-1, you're up there. But try to, to stay on the ground, because there will be more games. And probably all of them will not be as easy as it was in Germany. During his time as England boss, Ericsson experienced firsthand the intense media scrutiny of a position that one of his predecessors, Graham Taylor, described as the impossible job. I remember my first press conference in, uh, in England, in London, and I, I expected a big thing, but it was bigger than I thought. Phew. And the questions, yeah, some nice, some good, some not that nice, but anyhow, it was big. But you get prepared of that because I came from Italy, and the press in Italy is, is not a kindergarten. So I think I was prepared. Then I was not prepared about uh, outside football. Well, my private life. I was not prepared of that. I could never imagine that that would be such a mess in one way, such interest around what I thought was what was said. But it became much, much bigger than I thought. Before you, the man in the street could probably not name the partner of the English manager. I think the average England football fan could name three of your former girlfriends. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not very proud of that <laughs> at all. Uh, unfortunately, yes. Um, what shall I say? Shall I defend myself or...? <laughs> well, I don't know. Do you think that, I mean, it gave you a reputation as a womaniser, and do you think it damaged your image? Uh, I don't think it damaged my uh, football results or how people looked at me as a coach. I don't think so. But my image outside football, I think it damaged. Yes, I think so. But I'm not sure about that. I never asked people about that. I never talked about it publicly. Because I... Naive, maybe? Because I thought, well... Why do you call it private life? It's private. But it was not very much private during these times in England. I w it would be impossible. Yeah. It was impossible in one way, but... Did you ever feel the need to say anything to the players at all about what was happening in your private life? Yeah. First time, this is 2002, we're talking about <clears throat> when it came out about a woman. Which uh, one? Uh, well, a Swedish one. Okay, I think <laughs> we know. So I felt the first training, I felt, what shall I tell the players? And because it has nothing to do with football, but anyhow, I'm, I'm the manager of them and we're going into a World Cup and so I, I, I said, 
sorry, gentlemen, about all the fuss in the newspapers and uh, it can't help us as a team or helping me or helping you and uh, I'm sorry. Then one of the players stood up and said, boss, welcome to England. And that was it. <laughs> and it was, I felt whew, good. Now this is over. <laughs> Shake? Yeah, they tried to offer me a job in Dubai. But I said no to that at once. Uh, I was not interested in them. Then they came into other uh, things and Aston Villa was on the... Yeah, why not Aston Villa when I finish in England? Mm. But that had nothing to do with money, really. <clears throat> well, if you believe news of the world, yes, but they never offered me they offered me a job and said big money, but I was not interested in that. They were dubbed the golden generation, the England players that you had. Do you believe they deserved that accolade in terms of other players around the world? I don't know that. I don't know where it came from the golden generation. The truth is, there were a lot of good football players during that time, and I always said, I am still saying, I think we were not ready to win the World Cup uh, 2002. No. Or Euro 2004, but we were ready 2006. That was one of the best games England played during my time. I lost more or less everything when I was in England. Is that probably your biggest regret in football? Losing that game was... You could only save one piece of football memorabilia. What would you save? Oh, maybe that one. I'm in the small Swedish town of Sunny with football godfather Sven Jorn Eriksson. A groundbreaker who oversaw Swedish club football's first European triumph became the first ever foreign manager of the England national team. When I finished the job in England, the FA, they gave me this. Yes. Um, Good memories, though. Absolutely. After reaching the quarterfinals in both the 2002 World Cup and the 2004 European Championships, England headed to the World Cup in Germany two years later with mounting expectations to go further. We should have done it at that time. So why didn't you win it? Well, we played one hour, 10 against 11. That didn't help you, for sure. Once again, penalty shootouts. I thought we were mentally stronger for that. But at the end, we weren't. Is that probably your biggest regret in football? Yeah, it's the biggest loss when we losing against Portugal. And you know that that was my last game. You coming into the dressing room. Yes, what shall you say? We lost. Talking about the future. 
that was bad. It was not easy. Losing that game was shit. I remember being at the press conference and there wasn't a lot of talk about the penalties. There was a lot of interest in Rooney and how he had, inverted commas, let his country down. But you were at pains to protect him, weren't you? Yes, of course, because even if that was the last minutes of my work as England manager, my job is still to protect football players, always, especially my players. And I remember 98 Beckham, they killed him after he's been sent off. So I said something like, and I meant it really from my heart, don't kill this young boy. He's still young, and I said, you need him. And I also said, you can kill me because you don't need me anymore. And that's the fact. Very generous. Well, <laughs> I think it's your duty as a coach. So pay attention, please. He is the golden boy of English football. Don't kill him. Do you have a, a favourite moment as England manager? Well, you talked about Germany, mm -hmm. of course. But I think many other times, every time you qualify for the big tournaments, it's big. Uh, we qualified beating Greece, free kick, Beckham, 90 minutes and more. Uh, <clears throat> and you feel, I think, you beat Argentina in the World Cup. Mm. And you know that this was an extremely good performance. We did defending, attacking, uh, really professional. Maybe people don't remember, they don't, but I think that was one of the best games England played during my time. There were also some other times as England manager where you appeared to want to leave to sign a contract and go to another club, Chelsea in particular. Sven Joran Eriksson is once again facing trial by tabloid after he was seen visiting new Chelsea owner Roman Abramovich. Yes, true. Manchester United before that. Then it but came the criticism Chelsea. is you were England manager and you were negotiating to take a job elsewhere. Do, do you regret those actions? If you are the England manager, you have to sit and do the whole... Um, contract you have with them. You cannot finish by yourself because then you are a traitor. Uh, so you have to sit and wait until they sack you or the contract is finished. Maybe it's fair but I was in Lazio. I was in the middle of a contract. I had one and a half year to go and England comes up. So I asked Lazio, I'm leaving. And it was the same when Chelsea came up, but uh, <clears throat> it came out in the papers uh, and it became a big thing. And of course, I think FA felt embarrassed. They said, I cannot stop it. So at the end, I signed a, a new contract. That was the start of the, the label you given that you're money minded. Or um, avaricious. Do you reject that? Or is money that's something important to you? Yes, I'm born poor. Uh, happy, but I didn't have money. My fa parents didn't have money. Of course, they had money. I never suffered anything. No. But not rich at all. I became a little bit healthy by football. I lost more or less everything when I was in England or end of my England. To a con man? Yeah. So I became rather poor again. And then, well, going to China and some other countries. And I'm okay now. But money has never been anything 
which interested me. And I never knew how much money I had in the bank, when I had money. They tell you when you don't have money, then the bank phones you. <laughs> yeah, it works like that. Yeah. <laughs> so money has never been anything which I've been... I, I think I got that in England. I don't know why, but uh, I think that was not fair. Because I'm not like that. I had more hair at that time. Well, that's what the England job does to you. <laughs> takes, it, takes it away. <laughs> I think he captured you. If you could meet a young Sven Jorn Eriksson, aged just 26, about to go into his first coaching job. What advice would you like to give him? <laughs> it would be great if life was like that. You could start again <laughs> with good advices. It's not like that, but... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you always do some mistakes in life, of course. We all do it, and you regret it, and life goes on. I would tell him, next time, think twice before you take a d big decisions. decision. Going to the right club, the right moment, and things like that. Do you think whether they are uh, clubs or situations or people in your life that perhaps has not turned out so well for you, that they were impulsive decisions that you should have thought through better? Sometimes, yes, for sure. And um, if you want something, really want something, sometimes you, you rush it. You should uh, sit down and think about it. A couple of more minutes, maybe. <laughs> and also... But that's life, I mean, that makes life... Uh, oh, it's a hypothetical uh, question. ...thrilling as well. You, you want it and <clears throat> you take it. Well, Sven, all I can say, um, thank you very much for having us here. Pleasure. In, ...in your home. It's been a wonderful, wonderful journey, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much indeed. Thank you.